Hello, and welcome to the third webinar in a series of online activities about ocean sewage pollution. My name is Kristen Mays. I am the Reef Resilience Network Manager and your host for this webinar, which is brought to you by the Nature Conservancy with support from the Reef Resilience Network and NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program. Today's webinar, Long Island Sewage Story, is a two-part webinar about a 10-year effort to tackle the daunting nitrogen pollution issue on Long Island and to shift the paradigm in water management there. Our presenters joining us from the Nature Conservancy's New York chapter are Stuart Lowry, Water Priority Director, and Chris Clapp, Water Quality and Public Policy Specialist. Really grateful to have you both. During the two webinars, Stuart and Chris will describe their ongoing recipe for impactful and enduring conservation, good science, adaptive strategies, technological innovation, social, social science to shift behaviors, policy initiatives, new funding streams, and partnerships of all kind. We recognize it is a lot to cover, which is why we've broken up the content into two webinars. So today's webinar is part one of the story and we'll focus on how to begin creating enabling conditions for sewage mitigation via internal and external readiness and how to identify champions for your efforts in social science and communications. Part two on November 12th will focus on the role of partnerships, tactics to build support, financing, and durable changes that they've achieved so far during implementation. As a reminder, the Reef Resilience Network is in the process of developing a body of resources for managers to address the threat of sewage pollution. In addition to this webinar series, resources include web pages on reefresilience.org, case studies highlighting sewage monitoring and management strategies, and an online course to help managers build understanding on this topic and the ways they can act. A couple of quick housekeeping items. Today's webinar will be one hour. Following the presentation, we'll have a discussion session there are two ways you can ask questions. You can type your question into the question box at any time during the presentation or during the discussion session and we'll ask your question for you. Or you can raise your hand during the Q&A session and we'll call on you. You can unmute your microphone and ask your question aloud. If you're having any technical difficulties during the presentation, such as trouble hearing or seeing the slides, please just send us a message via the same question box and we'll do our best to resolve the issue. Because this webinar focuses on the value of social science to shift behaviors, we'd love to hear from you before we get started. Um, if you've used social science to understand how to motivate your audience to act, so for example, if you've taken time to learn about your audience through interviews, focus groups, or other techniques to understand what they know about your issue or topic and, and what they care about. And then if you've used that information to develop messages that, that speak to your audience or resonate with them and identify which tactics are gonna be most effective in reaching them and motivating them to act. So we're going to put a quick poll question up here um, to get a sense of, of your experience with social science to inform communication. Give you a, a couple moments to digest the question and respond. Okay, it looks like over half of you have, about 30% no, 14 unsure. Okay, well, good to see that we have a number of folks who have some experience in this field and um, some newbies, so hopefully we'll have a lot to learn from, from Chris and Stuart. Um, thank you for participating in the poll, and Chris, I'd love to turn it over to you to begin the presentation and get us going. Sorry, all. Uh, let me get a proper 
slide up there. And we see your slides, but we don't see you anymore, Chris. We'd love to see you. There we go. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Welcome all. Uh, today, I'm going to start off with a brief uh, introduction and then about how we uh, got into talking about sewage and its impacts on the marine environment. Uh, and then I will hand it over to my colleague, Stuart Lowry, who will take it from there for the remainder of the presentation. So our original goals as the Long Island chapters marine and coastal team was to pre preserve the key species that were the keystone species of our marine environment, seagrass beds, salt marshes, and shellfish. At the time, we had just acquired uh, roughly 21 square miles uh, of, of bay bottom in the Great South Bay between the mainland of Long Island and the barrier island of Fire, of Fire Island from the former Blue Point Oyster Company and began a shellfish restoration effort. Uh, we focused on hard clams as oysters or native oysters were about a century uh, in the rear view mirror and there was still a, re a remnant population of hard clams. At the time, this was one of the largest uh, shellfish restoration projects uh, of its kind of doing spawner sanctuaries. And for every uh, dollar that we spent on actual physical restoration activities, in the water, we spent $3 on research and monitoring to understand our progress and to answer questions that we didn't quite yet understand. And what we saw, if you see here on the bottom, uh, the middle screen shows um, here in the middle, you'll see all of our spawner sanctuaries on our property. Uh, and you can see how the cooler numbers show a lower density population of adult hard clams. Uh, and then the warmer colors here show the recruitment of what was believed to be at the time the largest um, seed recruitment in the Bay's history. So there was proof of concept that we could restore the system, or at least we could restore shellfish to the system by focusing on spawner sanctuaries and creating the conditions for the shellfish to thrive. However, that very year, uh, that that sample, those samples were taken, the harmful algae bloom brown tide returned to the South Shore Bays. And the very following year, as you can see here on the, uh, the, the picture on the bottom of the page, all of those young shellfish perished. We were also continuing to see a uh, steady decline in our eelgrass, our submerged aquatic vegetation habitats, and our salt marshes were calving like glaciers at the edges. Uh, and you can see that from these CAT scan here, uh, a healthy root system uh, keeps, helps keep the marsh intact. And shellfish, uh, I'm sorry, salt marshes impacted by nitrogen pollution have greatly reduced uh, root systems as the plants do not need to send out as many roots to get the nu nutrients they need and focus their growth on above ground biomass, causing the marshes to fail when storms or even normal wind and wave activity hit them. All of that work was, all of that research was coming in just about at the same time. And so we needed to know what the source of the problem was so that we could begin to focus on, the, on abating that source. So we did the first nitrogen load analysis for the Great South Bay watershed here in yellow. Uh, at that time, we then learned that roughly 70% of the land-based nitrogen coming into this watershed was from septic systems and cesspools. Up until that time, for about three decades up until that time, we've been told it's stormwater, it's fertilizer, it's stormwater, it's fertilizer, and that's all we had been, been told for three decades. So having known this, and now here seeing even further degrading water quality all around Long Island since then, and, and research around each one of these harmful algal blooms, low dissolved oxygen events, 
fish kills, cyanobacteria blooms, all the data that's being uh, generated from the research studies trying to find out the sources of these water quality impairments led us into the watershed and had the common theme of its nutrients from cesspools and septic systems that is driving these conditions which we do not find conducive to our way of life. So faced with such information, we literally had three questions in front of us as a team. We could just give up and quit as this is too big of a um, problem to handle. We could keep trying with shellfish uh, and clams and seagrass as we had been doing for decades before, or we could follow the data that, we, that had been guiding us down a path that we weren't quite sure where we were going, but we knew eventually it would, it would lead back into restoring the ecosystem at some point in time. Fortunately for us, we chose the latter. We chose to follow the data and retooled ourselves to uh, begin to focus with laser light focus on what it is we need to do to overcome the source of our problems so that we could then come back to restoring those systems once we had that source load under control. Uh, with that, I will pass it over to Stuart Lowry. Great, thanks, Chris. Uh, a great introduction. So, a dispassionate measuring of our lack of success at shellfish restoration on Long Island led us to conclude that we needed to fix water quality uh, in Long Island's bays and harbors if we expected to reach that goal, the outcome of ecosystem restoration and a recovery of the uh, shellfish and nearshore environment. So we knew now, now from science that nitrogen pollution from sewage was the biggest part of the problem. If we could wrap our arms around that and mitigate it, there was a chance of achieving the recovery of the system. The system itself is really quite resilient if you just take the stressors out. So that was 2012. And at that moment, as Chris has said, everybody thought the problem was from a different source. And there were probably only about 30 of us on Long Island, a population of 3 million, that had any idea that septic pollution, nitrogen pollution from septic systems was what was doing, the, doing us in, in the near shore environment. So we had a huge challenge. What did we do? It's clear that we needed to do something big um, and we needed to get ourselves organized around uh, a system change. So next slide, Chris. The good news here is that the concepts of system change are not rocket science. And there are a lot of things that you can grab onto to try to move the system in a different direction. This is a paradigm shift. One water is what um, the US Water Alliance calls the idea of water security, and that's what we're trying to generate on Long Island. So in this daisy wheel that we'll be referring to uh, today and uh, in our next meeting later in November, we'll be talking about the different levers that you can pull and push to try to get the system that is creating the conditions that are destructive to change. So for us, um, we'll just go around the daisy wheel real quickly. If you look at the planning collaboration, this is, um, is there some entity building an institution? Um, is it is so there somebody working on a manual for how to get to a better place, a guide for getting from where we are to where we need to go, culture and knowledge and capacity? That is really pointed at you as a, an organization that's interested in fixing a problem. Are you ready to push this? Are you internally organized? Are you thinking, uh, do you have the right knowledge to, to direct at the problem? Do you have the capacity to do it? Um, citizens and stakeholder engagement, are people, um, partners aligned with you and willing to go to bat with you to try to get the change to happen? Economics and finance, how are you gonna pay for this? It's, it's never as cheap as you'd like it to be. So what creative ways do you have to find the financing and the economic changes that are necessary to get the solution to happen? Regulation and legislation, can you remove the blockers and create things that assist the change? and bold leadership. Can you find somebody, can it even be you and your organization, who can step to the plate and 
grab the bully pulpit and lead the charge. So those are the six pedals of the water paradigm shift. Uh, if you want to get from where you are to a better place, let's focus today, next slide, on two of these elements. And in our next session in November, we'll focus on the others. So culture, knowledge, and capacity, citizen and stakeholder engagement. These are sort of the, uh, the essence of creating the enabling conditions that will get us to a better, a better place, that will make it easier for uh, key audiences to move in our direction towards the solutions that we're hoping to, to achieve. And I just want to say a quick word about uh, who, who the citizens are, who the, where the culture, knowledge, and capacity come from, and how you build out what essentially is a campaign. Uh, there are two quick models. One model is your organization is really embedded in this whole situation. You have great credibility. You've been on the landscape. You've done a lot of stuff. People trust you. You can step in and be a real organizer and a leader. In other situations, you're not the person on the ground that has the greatest credibility, but you can sit beside that person or that organization and help them organize things and provide activation energy and some resources so that you can get the solution that you need. So those are two models. Both of them can be in play at the same time, depending on the circumstances. Um, but you should be aware of the fact that the more you have a credibility in the landscape where you're trying to affect change, the better it is for you to just step in and try to take a leadership role and use the science and the, the power of the bully pulpit that you have to get the results that you want. So on Long Island, we were lucky. We had that capacity to be both the catalyst for change and a leader to help push that change. We had a lot of credibility with the local government, with the uh, county government, and with the state government. So everybody trusted us. They trusted us as an arbiter of good science. And when we started talking about this problem, they would listen to us and they would begin to follow our direction if we made it easy for them. So um, one thing I will add here is that as you try to make system change, you need to remember first, you need to get right with your own entity, your own organization before you go out and start to talk with other entities to build partnerships. You need to make sure that internal to your own organization, you've got a clear sense of what you're going to do, what you're going to contribute, the resources you're going to bring to the table, and what your uh, message and approach is going to be, so that you're not finding that people from your own organization are saying different things to different people. There has to be a consistency and internal alignment before you go out. And that was our first challenge. So we had a lot of different ideas, next slide, Chris, about how to manage for the change that we wanted to see that would get the nutrient loading out of the system. And we needed to align as a team around the fact that one, we were a team, and two, that there, were, there would be a particular approach that we would take, we would push forward. So make sure your project team is aligned and engaged before you leave the office to try to do outreach, because otherwise you'll start tripping over each other and your credibility will be really quickly diminished. We avoided that because we, we realized that we needed to do some good solid management training to get ourselves oriented, organized, and listening to one another and building uh, a solid message that we all stuck to. So we used this management training to figure out how we could align deeply as a team around the highest priority work, how we could act quickly to get early results and how we would adjust our activities as a team going along. This meant that we had to learn the value of really listening to learn and asking clarifying questions rather than challenging and confrontational uh, engagement. So it was a shift for us, uh, but it was incredibly important and really made us a, a vital team force as we worked our way through the, the work that came next. So the other thing that we had to do, next slide, was we had to have in our brains that body of challenges that we were confronting. So 
the system change is not one problem, but it's a whole series of smaller nested problems. So that line you see across the top of this document, which we call our critical path, is all of the different problems that we knew we were going to encounter. So we didn't know what the boundaries of watersheds were on Long Island that we were going to confront and have to manage for. We didn't know the uh, nitrogen loading priority, who needed to go get fixed first, where was it coming from, how was it transported, how fast did it go. We didn't know how much nitrogen needed to come out of each watershed if we wanted to hit the recovery goals that would allow the ecosystem to rebound. The technology that we needed was illegal in Suffolk County when we started. There was no implementation mandate uh, on the horizon. No one was being told they had to use new technology that was not polluting. There was no money to do any of this work. And the government that we were working with did not have any capacity or internal structure to reorganize itself and focus on this particular problem. So as you can see, those are really daunting pieces of the larger system change that we were looking at. And what we built out was little incremental steps that we would shoot for. And if we could achieve a number of those incremental steps in those little chevrons below each of those um, bullets, then we were making progress towards the ultimate goal. And collectively, we would, um, we would know uh, how much progress we were getting by how many of those little chevrons we were able to tick off over the, of a period of uh, our, our effort. So I wanna emphasize one other thing I advance one more. Across the bottom, a lot of this depends on effective communications and messaging. And we'll talk a lot about that in a minute. But I want you to note that uh, light blue arrow that we had naively placed on this chart in 2013, 18 month timeline from start of boundary delineation to implementation. So 17 years later, well, let's see, seven years later, we're now in the early phases of some parts of the implementation. We are not done. So a key takeaway here is that this stuff takes a lot longer than you think, it gonna, you think it's going to take. System change takes a long time, and it's really hard. So the critical path is one way to unpack the problems that you're going to encounter, anticipate them, and begin building out strategies to address each of the challenges. So one of the things that we wanted to do early on was to have a successful, robust communications effort. And to underpin that, we worked with three key organizations on Long Island to build what we call the Long Island Clean Water Partnership, build a web presence, and use that partnership web presence to create a larger buzz about the sorts of challenges that we had on Long Island with respect to the water quality and how those challenges might be fixed. So this was a real go-to spot to send people who wanted to learn more about the challenge. Uh, it was where we put up our best science and we put up our, uh, our, our good messaging. This was a way that we increased our capacity because we couldn't do all this work by the Nature Conservancy alone. We needed partners who could take up the communications and the lobbying work along with us to increase our impact. Uh, next slide. So it's really important to know about the community and your target audience, what they value, how they perceive their circumstances with respect to the water quality issues and what interests them. How do they talk about their situation? What's the language they use? Because if you're not using the language of the target audience, of the people that are on the landscape, you're probably talking past them. And you need to talk to people where they are not where you wish they were. So you need to figure out where they are and there's social science that helps you get to that place. So we decided that we would invest early, uh, very heavily in a whole bunch of social science to try to get ourselves oriented on the landscape so that we didn't misstep and misstate and piss people off and make people walk away and say they don't know what they're talking about. They're not talking to me. They're not talking about anything I care about. We started with focus groups. Focus groups allow you to put a whole bunch of assumptions out there on the table in a really carefully planned discussion. We used professional uh, focus group leaders and we built out a script to test messages, to probe people's willingness to engage with the issue and to find out what it was they cared about, to, to try to explore their, their identity and their connectivity to the issue of clean water 
and what their fears, hopes, and concerns, perceptions, and values were. So that when we started talking about that stuff to them later on in our media uh, efforts, we'd be talking a language and a messaging that they already knew and they already liked. Uh, in our focus groups, next slide. Um, we, you're able to do in focus groups things that you're not easily able to do in surveys. So one of the things that I would encourage you to probe in focus groups is visual preferences. So I'll let you guess which of these four images turns out to be wildly more interesting to the average Long Islander than any of the others. And if you pick the one in the upper left, you win. A girl at the water fountain. So Long Islanders are very connected to the safety of their drinking water. And this image really embodies a lot of their concerns, their hopes, all in one fell swoop, future generations, sustainability, the whole nine yards. So focus groups allowed us to get at the way that we visually talk about our message. You, in the world of conservation, we're really lucky because a huge amount of the way that we can reach people uh, is visual. We have beautiful images of the things that we want to restore, the things we want to save, um, and these are extremely compelling. When you put people in those images, they're even more compelling. What we found out in our focal group, focus groups was another key way of reaching Long Islanders, um, and that was that they do have uh, a very intrinsic sense of uh, belonging to a water world. Their view of the, the island that they live on is centered around its water resource. No surprise, but if you make that assumption and you're wrong, you can go down a blind alley in terms of communication. So we tested that assumption. It's a very strong identity. Even people that don't ever get to the water or get to the water once or twice a year still think of themselves and the, their quality of life as being attached to that island identity, that water identity. They're very concerned about the quality of that water. They're worried about what's gonna happen with it. Is it dirty? Does it cause cancer? Is it uh, polluted? Uh, all of these things, plus their, uh, their connection to the recreational value of the water, very powerful uh, entry points for us in having the conversation with them uh, about water quality. Next slide. So a lot of assumptions that we poked at um, we resulted in some really curious um, changes in attitude. So one of the things that we think about in the world of science is that people aren't going to understand why we have to do the stuff we have to do to the toilet to keep uh, water pollution from getting into the groundwater unless they understand how the water flows through the aquifer and how it flows out into the bays and harbors and how we pull our water out of the aquifer into our drinking water supply. Um, it turns out that doesn't matter. Uh, when we ask people where do they think their water came from, uh, most Long Islanders had either a very bad idea or no idea at all. Uh, they thought their water came from hundreds of miles away from a source that the city of New York uses that Long Island does not use and does not have access to. Or they simply had no idea. They thought, well, I turn on the tap. It comes from the tap. These are not very helpful, and it turned out it didn't matter where they thought the water come from, came from or where they thought it went when they flushed the toilet. When we told them that scientists say um, nitrogen pollution from sewage is a problem for us on Long Island, they were on board very quickly with just a little bit of additional information uh, and very supportive of efforts to eliminate that nitrogen pollution from sewage. So a key thing to remember, um, People are outcome focused, not process focused. And when we talk about watersheds, we're talking about process, nobody cares except us. Don't waste your time talking about process, talk about the outcome and your relationship to that outcome that they want and you want. Okay, next slide. From the focus groups, we move very quickly into uh, quantitative testing to try to get ourselves focused on the most important way to talk about the messaging. The, the narrative that we wanted to create for use with uh, our key target audiences. And a typical poll would have five or 600 people in it. You do it in a short period of time so that you could avoid any in interfering confounding variables. Um, and your results are generally pretty interesting and pretty uh, sobering. So you find out that some of the messages you thought were gonna be really great 
stink and nobody likes them. And some of the messages that you weren't sure were gonna pop actually jump off the charts. So these are really key pieces of data and your pollster will help you put together messages or you can try it yourself. But here's the next slide, some of the messaging that we've tested over the years. Um, you know, the quality of life messages, really important. The impact of brown tide, future generations, work farmland, what do people care about? We've tested all kinds of stuff. So next slide, the stuff that pops. Um, I want you to look at this really carefully. The stuff that's dark green, the very con convincing uh, arguments uh, are the ones that you're most interested in. So anything that's above 50% on very concerning or very convincing argument is really super useful for building out your narrative, for talking about the work that you're gonna do. Um, so another thing that you'll do in polling um, is you're gonna you're not just gonna test all the affirmative messages that promote the outcomes that you're shooting for. You're probably also gonna test negative messages. Why would you do that? Well, there are a couple of reasons, and I sum it up by saying, no, keep your friends close, but keep your enemies closer. You need to know what your opponents are likely to say or do to try to knock you off your game and to try to interrupt your progress towards the system change that you need to get that ecosystem restoration. They're gonna do all kinds of unscrupulous things. And if you know ahead of time where they get the most traction, you can actually inoculate yourself against their negative messages. So you wanna test the negatives and build out the inoculation to the negatives when you create your message triangle which is the next slide. So this is a, similar to what I think many of you in the Reef Network are using or have been invited to use called a message box. It basically takes the most highly polled, most persuasive messages and orients them around the key central message that is what you should lead with whenever you talk about the issue. So for us, the lead message is always nitrogen pollution from sewage threatens Long Island's health, economy, and quality of life, and we have to fix it now. This polls off the charts. 70% uh, find these messages, combination of messages, to be incredibly persuasive and convincing. And then around it are all the different ways in which we tackle the nitrogen pollution threat. Cleaning up our water to protect our children, local waters that are clean or safer, nitrogen pollution, uh, threatens our health and here's what we can do by fixing our infrastructure and down underneath the longer we wait to fix our water quality problems the worse it will get the longer it will take the more expensive it will be if we start now with a modest water fee we can really get in behind this and we can fix this so that our quality of life and our economy are protected so a message triangle is shared out with your partners it's the go-to way of talking about the problem by everyone in your organization and every partner organization that you can get trained on it. Um, it's, it's an essential tool. When we built this message triangle, my supervisor took it into her hands, looked at it and said, this was worth every penny of the $300,000 we spent on our uh, media consultant. This will change everything for us. So, that was a quick run through the world of how you set up enabling conditions. Next slide. The next time we get together, we'll be talking about building an echo. How do you use your communications tools to reach the audiences that need to hear from you? And how does that connect to creating bold leadership? We'll talk about how do you get in behind the fact that there are no regulations that support the work that you wanna do? How do you change those regulations? And then how do you collaborate with government partners who might be a little skittish about the financial implications of the stuff that you're doing? That and other things will all be part of our focus in two weeks. So I'll kick it back to you, Kristen. Thanks, Stuart. Oops, that was really interesting and um, rather heartening i have to say i've worked on a, a similar campaign a behavior change campaign in maui hawaii aimed at reducing polluted runoff from reaching the ocean and most of the things that you said throughout the presentation if we just inserted maui where you said long island um word for word uh, very similar so same thing we focused on 
um, really protecting quality of life and you know help inspiring people to protect what they love um, and and quickly realized we didn't need to talk about what a watershed is and explain the process so awesome uh, I'd love to open it up for questions and discussions uh, TNC senior scientist Dr. Stephanie Ware will also be joining our discussion session hey Steph saw you for a minute hey. if you want to turn your camera on too so we can see you um, while she's doing that just remember you can either send us your question in the question box and we can read it aloud for you or if you want to ask your question yourself go ahead and, and raise your hand there's a little hand icon that you can click and we'll unmute you and you can ask your question yourself um, and in addition to questions like I said we, we really are kind of uh, encouraging you to share examples, examples of your uh, sewage mitigation work or any experience you have with social science to uh, create change. Let's see, I will go ahead and pull up the question box. So let's start with what part of the Long Island communication work do you consider the most effective? Maybe Stuart, that's addressed to you. I uh, yeah. So there are a lot of communications plays out in so many different realms. I would say in uh, and at different times. So I think for us, getting the media, the local media, to buy into our narrative was huge and transformational. So when we started out this work. Um, and we're doing our focus group and uh, polling work, we uncovered the fact that nitrogen pollution really popped. People really reacted to that. So we chose that as the way we would describe the, the challenge that we were confronting. We need to fix nitrogen pollution. And prior to our entry onto the scene with polling and focus group work, nitrogen pollution as a concept did not exist in the media on Long Island. It was never used. It was um, not, a, not a thing. Now, uh, because of the work that we did to insert that into the world of the media and their view of water challenges, every time there's an article about water on Long Island, it will include the words nitrogen pollution, if not once, many times. Mm. And that's all the work that we did as the Nature Conservancy and amplified by our partners. So I'd say getting the media on your side, hugely important. Awesome. Oh, let's see about uh, approximately how much money was spent to implement the outreach. It's always a burning question. Yeah, our uh, our first dab at this was a budget of three hundred thousand. That included a bunch of money for polling and focus groups. It also included a hundred thousand to do a cable television ad buy and the production of a uh, a little ad. We'll talk a little more about that uh, in two weeks in our next session. So the total budget to get this launched was about 300,000. Uh, you can do this a lot more cheaply. Um, we took the Cadillac version because we didn't know what we were doing, but uh, across Long Island Sound from us, uh, a very valued colleague of ours, Holly Drinketh, modeled work in Connecticut on the work that we've done on Long Island. And she was able to find, because she knew where she wanted to go and she had a sense of what the messaging was already, she found pollsters and a little bit of focus group money. And she was able to build out the message triangle and uh, get her narrative put together for you know uh, a tenth of what we spent. And you could probably get cheaper than that and do something really effective. Yeah, and I would just add that depending on where you are, those are New York prices and in some places, it's a lot more cost effective or less expensive to do things like that. So we don't want people to be intimidated by those numbers because they're relative to the place for sure. Exactly. Absolutely. And just taking the time to, to think through those steps and take time to ask questions can be just as powerful um, than a lot of the research. So it is, you know, still a lot of lessons learned from the process. Okay, next question, including the deep dive on social science, oh, sorry, including this deep dive on social science is great to see. 
what made you know to invest heavily in social science? So really interesting question. I like that. Um, I, I can, I have to answer that question with a description of what we had already done on Long Island. We had used social science, um, particularly polling, to run ballot campaigns. So when you're doing that, you need to know, is your measure likely to pass? And what are the messages that people will respond to during the campaign season, which is literally three weeks for a ballot measure. So we were already cued into the value of social science. When we ran into this one water, water security challenge and the nutrient problem, we realized we knew nothing about how to talk about this. We could talk about land protection. You know, the Nature Conservancy is a huge land trust, and that's our DNA. But we had no idea how to talk about water quality challenges with, uh, with 3 million Long Islanders. So it was really clear to us, because of our prior experience with social science, that was the route to go first. Make sure that you understood where your audience was before you tried to talk to them about this issue. So it was a no-brainer. Thanks, Stuart. And Manuel, Can I ask a question? Oh, oh go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I think go we ahead, also, Kristen, Let me know when I. Yeah, I, I just want to finish that statement that Stuart was making. We also wanted to to be able to share, you know, because we knew that we were going to be asking our elected officials and champion and of those who we wanted to be the champions of change, asking them to stick their necks out. And I think we needed to show them that the people were behind them. Uh, and that, and only the polling could do that. Yeah, that's really key here. Uh, and all along this whole trajectory, Chris and I will be talking about this again uh, in our next session. You're constantly having to reassure elected officials that they're on solid ground. And the social science, particularly the polling, gives them enormous confidence that they can say this stuff and take these actions without any negative consequences for their next election. Absolutely. Steph, did you want to add something before I move to the next? Yeah, I well, I want to make sure I'm um, on topic and keeping the flow of conversation. So if you want to get to this later, we can. Um, the question is, um, just going back actually to maybe to Chris, when you talked about where you're at that point of, of um, having this new information, you'd made this huge investment. I remember I was with the Nature Conservancy when all the baby clams were getting um, put into these spawner sanctuaries. And we thought this was gonna be the answer, right? And it was widely promoted. This is a great solution. We started looking at it in other places. And um, and then you discover that you've got this other problem, right? And, and, and that is pretty awesome and exciting that you were able to tease out the source because that's difficult to do. So um, I guess my question around this is how, how difficult was it to make that switch to recognize we our first idea this widely promoted what we thought brilliant solution was wrong and now we're going to completely turn the ship in another direction and acknowledge a completely different threat that has completely different strategies and like that course correction while we're always doing course corrections in our work i feel like that that conservation is very iterative and it's a lot of little fails succeed, you know, and sort of process, but that's such a big one. And I'm curious about the challenges around that and what, what pushed you guys to double down on this problem basically and keep moving forward. So it, it was, to, to say it was a course correction is a, is a minor understatement. So the, um, I think that the fascinating thing was that that year or those two years where we saw the baby, where we saw the major recruitment events and, you know, and, and it actually, we were at first, we were amazed like, Oh my God, this is actually working. Like we got, we got billions, billions of little babies uh, from you know, less than a million adult clams that we just dumped in the water over the last three years and and we almost thought we worked ourselves out of a job because it happened too quickly and and then and then everything died so then we were worried that we worked ourselves out of a job by proving that 
our experiment wasn't going to work. So I think what made us commit to the course correction was uh, the overwhelming amount of data from multiple habitat research and monitoring efforts from different parts of the region all coming in within a five-year window period right so it was there was data coming in from the chesapeake from cape cod narragansett bay and and our own bays and it was all saying the same thing it was a bunch of different people working on similar projects and they all came to the same conclusions about climate change and, and nutrient uh, pollution. And that the only thing that people can do locally was the nutrient pollution while we work on our lifelong challenge of, of climate adaptation. So, you know, I, I remember sitting in the room where we, we were literally faced with those three choices was, well, we could just kind of keep doing the restoration stuff as a, programmatic thing because that's what donors like and it's sexy and fun and people people don't mind paying for this stuff um but it felt so too sisyphean you know so it was um and i recall marcy bortman once again saying that when we did make the decision to make the pivot she said you guys do realize this is life-changing this is not a five-year effort by deciding today that we're going to go ahead and jump in and focus on the source of the problem, you're committing to your entire rest of your life to focus on this because it's not going to happen overnight. And it was a really sobering conversation. But uh, I think what I said, uh, you know, as I said, it was the overwhelming amount of data and, and, and literature from all over the region uh pointing towards the same thing that you know it's interesting you say that um because i just got an email from a very prominent coral reef um conservationist in the caribbean who's been working on monitoring caribbean reefs for probably 30 plus years and she said the same thing to me she said i am so tired uh, like sort of linking restoration. She said, we need to force a marriage with the restoration work that is sexy and appealing to donors and even scientists because it's really tinkering with the system. And we, we're, we're gonna have to work on forcing a marriage here in the coral reef space. And, you know, because we're ignoring this water quality issue in general, and we're, we're starting to grow baby corals and outplant them without really thinking as much as we should be about water quality. So it's funny you say that. And, and I'm starting to feel the same as Marcy, who is um, one of your marine conservation leads in New York. So I should just say that, but um, this is going to be a life changing. This is life changing. And it, it's definitely been life changing for me. So I, I relate. Yeah, can I Manuel? quickly add a couple of points oh, yeah. to that? Or are we just running? Yeah, just, you know, the thing that made the pivot work for us on Long Island was that we had uh, leadership, the executive director, who just said, this is what the science tells us, this is what you're telling me, I'm going to run with it, let's do it. There was no resistance. She said, I trust you, I know what you're talking about, it makes sense, let's do it. And she brought along all of our major donors, and she got them excited about it. She listened to this, the uh, social science that we put together, and it works on your donors too. They're, they're people, they live there. And that really made the difference. I'll add one last caveat here. This stuff goes on for a long time. You know, we're nine years into this and we're not done. And you will encounter donor fatigue. So you gotta keep thinking about where the really challenging, exciting, incremental progress lies that you can market in a short time frame as you keep your eye on the long-term prize. Awesome. Thanks, Stuart. Manuel, I see your hand is up. I'm going to unmute you. And if you'd like to ask your question or share your comment aloud yourself, please go for it. And you're unmuted. You'll just, oh. Okay. Hi, everyone. Hi, Steph. <laughs> 
Um, Kristen, uh, Stuart and Christopher, thank you so much for your excellent sharing. Um, it really uh, gives us encouragement here in Maui. And, and like Steph said, in the coral reef space, it's pretty much the same situation, <laughs> eutrophication and the sources of stressors and all of that. Um, so on Maui, we have the injection wells problem and the Supreme Court uh, ruled um, that it is now illegal, as we've all thought, to uh, dump sewage, even though it's secondarily treated into the groundwater and into the reefs. So um, there's so much science already, and a colleague of mine is doing uh, nitrogen isotope studies. We know where the sources of stressors are. We're, we're in the initial phases of cap planning and all of that. And I just really appreciate your pragmatic uh, lessons learned that you guys shared. But what, I, what I'd what i like to ask is, what do you think is the, the linchpin that got the decision makers to support the uh, water quality fees and the regulation changes? Because it's really hard to do policy change. Thanks. Go, Chris. Who'd like well, to take that well, one? Okay. I'll let I'll 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 start off. And uh, but Manuel, I, I want to I want to thank you for for working on Maui. Like you guys are up against some serious odds there. Um, you know, I I feel for you because our septic systems and cesspools might as well all be injection wells as well. Um, they they don't call them that. They call them leaching pools, but they might as well be injection wells. Uh, another really interesting thing for is I think it's great you're doing that that isotope work because that was one of the bodies of research that TNC had funded through a region-wide study on seagrasses that kind of put us over the edge to jump into this was to seeing those relatively high uh you know in stable isotope language you know relatively heavy uh nitrogen signals which are indicative of human wastewater as opposed to the lighter signal that comes from the atmosphere and fertilizers. And, and that was one of the, so stick with that work, it'll pay off for you, it's, it's really important. Um, to your question about what was it that got regulations changed? I think, you know, Stewart's work, uh, you know, cause he was the real leader of it, the week long ad campaign in the in September of 2014, um, which was the season before our county exec was to be go for re-election, um, it was undeniable that this was a problem, and it was a problem that needed to be addressed uh, from the media perspective. And and at that point, that our leader made it his top made it his administration's top priority. And I think from that point on, I was a part, I might as well have been a partial county employee. Everything, everything that had to do with technology and regulation that had been done elsewhere, they, they, they came to me for, which was really exciting. Um, another big thing was I worked with our county staff on getting them a IBM Smarter Cities grant, um, which validated our concerns from a third party group of experts that that systemically broke down how we manage water here on Long Island and the ways that we could do things better. And that was really helpful as a kind of a third party validator coming in, uh, looking broadly at how water is managed and, and highlighting all the things that, that we do in a, such a fragmented way that lead us to the results that we currently have. And that was that was really, really helpful as well. And I'll, I'll let Stuart finish. Uh, there's not much to add. You really nailed it. And uh, th thank you for that. The, uh, the ability of county leadership to move into the water space, we provided. We made it safe for them. We went in with our poll results and we sat down and we actually walked them through the county executive, the deputy county executive and his chief of media. We walked them through line by line how the poll results played out and said, you can safely go here. You will be loved if you take this on. And lo and behold, they did. And in his 
um, state of the county speech after we did that um, introduction with him of, to the uh, social science, he declared that uh, nitrogen pollution was public water enemy number one. So we were off to the races. Wow, very cool. Thank you for your awesome work. Thanks, Manuel, for the question. Katie, I see you have a, a comment and question here. I want to see if you'd like to ask yourself. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you if you'd like to chime in. Please do. Otherwise, I can read your comment for you. But very relevant to the topic, so I want to give you an opportunity to speak. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to do a little shameless plug because I'm um, super excited about hearing the work um, that you guys are doing, and I think that it's um, so needed across the environmental sector. And so one of the things that we're doing, I am um, from RARE, uh, I work in the Center for Behavior and the Environment, and we're partnering with the Nature Conservancy and several other um, partner organizations to host a contest that's actually identifying solutions to reduce water pollution by using social science. Um, and so this is exactly the kind of stuff we're looking to identify. And so I just wanted to make a plug um, that if folks are, I saw a lot of folks um, in the survey said that they were doing social science work and we'd love to help surface that. Um, the contest website is solutionsearch.org. So it's a little bit of a shameless plug, um, but really, really based on the fact that what you're doing is exciting and I think it's really, um, ahead of the curve and things that people could learn from. So excited to see what else is also out there too. Thanks, Katie, for sharing. Very, very relevant, so we appreciate it. Um, and we're, we're getting close to time. There are a couple questions around focus groups, so I'll ask one. Um, looking for advice, do you recommend using a professional facilitator for the focus groups? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of things can happen in a focus group, and unless you have somebody there who's trained to intervene um, and calm things down, you can have a focus group that basically runs out of control and you don't get anything from it. Um, also, when you're setting them up, a professional focus group coordinator also has a lot of experience in how to put together the script and how to pose issues so that you're not leading the respondents, you're actually just uh, putting out neutral things that they can respond to, to so that you learn what their perceptions and values actually are, rather than putting yours out there and um, having them just glom on to them because that's what they're hearing. So for those reasons, I'd say if you can, go with a professional uh, focus group moderator. If you can't, Try to find somebody that has at least a little experience running really intense groups for 90 minutes at a time. Thank you, Stuart. And one last question here. So you had talked about connecting with locals in Long Island. How did you decide where was the most important place to reach out to or who, which group was the most important? So a really good question. I can give you the first level answer and Chris can probably give you a, a more nuance. So when we started down this pathway, building out our messaging, we knew that there were key people that could help make the change happen or could, that directly could uh, implement the change. So the county had enormous power because the, uh, the whole public health code was controlled and moderated and changed by the county and the county legislature. So elected and appointed officials in county government and in town government, which is very strong on Long Island as well, were an obvious target for us. Uh, we wanted them to know what the problem was and what their role was in fixing the problem. But the media was a target for us. We really worked the media hard. We introduced them to the, the ideas in the message triangle. We never gave them the message triangle. We didn't want to be that obvious. but they were very important to bring along. Um, other environmental organizations that didn't have water as a priority or even a big focus, when they talked about it, we wanted them to talk about it with the same language that we used so that the other audiences would get the right message. Civic leaders, very important. 
And there are other opinion leaders that we wanted to reach. So people that are, you know, highly placed in volunteer fire departments that are um, part of the um, committee structure of town government. We wanted them to also uh, get the message and use the language. Yeah, the only, I think the only ones that you might have left, so the, the primary targets were the elected officials and, and leaders in, of our um, local governments. We are a home rule state. The um, only thing missing from that analysis was the business community and the business leaders, uh, and, which and or the, the the builders the builders institute and the the development community um because as Stuart said earlier keep keep your friends close but keep your enemies closer right um they have uh outsized uh influence over our elected officials so if we if we could help the business community and the development community see their gains in improving water quality Right, so tying home values to increased water clarity, tying tourism income, restaurant income, all of that stuff to to en uh, enhanced water quality and thereby enhanced way of living, enhanced tourism. Then they could see they could see what's in it for them, and and so then then they also speak on our behalf for cleaning up Long Island's waters, and that I think that was critical as well. Thank you. Um, thank you to, to all of you. Really appreciate the presentations. I'm sorry to have to wrap up the discussion where we've come to the end of our hour. Um, for the questions we didn't get a chance to get to, um, please visit the Reef Resilience Network discussion forum. The link is there and we can um, go ahead and, and chat it as well. But this is our online discussion forum where managers and practitioners can, can share information and resources. So if you have a burning question that Stuart, Chris, or Stephanie didn't get to address, please post it there. And um, just circling back to some of the, the really important points that Stuart and Chris touched on, if you go to reefresilience.org, there is a whole communication module there, and we have a step-by-step -step process and a number of other resources that really help kind of demystify how to use social science to guide communication and how to develop a communication plan that will help you reach your conservation goal. And if you go under the communication planning process tab, you'll see we walk you through it step by step and there are worksheets and quizzes to help you apply what you learn to your own project. Uh, that information is all compiled in a guidebook. You can see an image of it here and that you can just download and work on yourself if you prefer offline work. Please let us know if you have any questions or we can support you in that process uh, through the network forum as well just like our previous webinars at the end. And so in just one moment, you'll receive a survey. Please share um, what you're interested in learning about for the sewage series and give us some feedback on the webinars. We will be sending out a recording of this presentation uh, along with a request for any sewage related photos. We're always on the hunt for photos as we build out our resources on the Reef Resilience Network Toolkit. So if you have photos to share, we'd really appreciate it and you can follow the instructions there. Uh, and we hope to see you, all of you, and um, look forward to seeing our panelists next or in two weeks at the part two of our Long Island sewage story. That'll be on November 12th. And as Chris and Stuart already mentioned, we'll, we'll really do a deeper dive and talk about the role of partnerships, tactics that they use to build support financing, and then the changes that they've experienced and seen created, I should say, so far. Uh, so hope to see you then. And thank you so much uh, for sharing the story and participating in the webinar. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us.